Hello, everyone. Welcome to INA Cole's March Leadership Webinar. Uh, we're very thrilled you could be here with us today. My name is Natalie Abel. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Director here at INA Cole, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar. So we're grateful you could join us, and we're really excited to explore ways to launch, improve, and sustain high school internship programs. We have a wonderful set of panelists here with us today. We have Jennifer and David from Big Picture Learning. And if you're not familiar with the Big Picture schools, uh, they have a tremendous uh, teaching and learning model that embeds internship programs um, into the K-12 and high school experience um, that really authentically engages students to their communities and, and helps them to develop important skills and dispositions necessary for future success. Um, and then we have two practitioners joining us as well. We have Carrie and Carleen, who are principals from Massachusetts and Idaho, who can share their experiences implementing internship programs in their schools as well. So before I turn it over to Jennifer to kick us off, I have just a couple housekeeping items to go over today. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a chat box. I encourage you to please introduce yourself. We would love to know who you are, where you're tuning in from, um, the role and organization of which you serve, um, and what you're hoping to get out of today's webinar. And we encourage you to ask a lot of questions as we go. We'll definitely save some time at the end for Q&A um, to get your questions answered. And if you are a fan of social media, we encourage you to share what you're learning with your peers and networks there as well. We can drop some um, social media um, information into the chat box for you so that you can um, connect with us um, on those platforms as well. And today's webinar will be recorded and archived. Um, on the inacol.org website. So we will send you a follow-up email that will include this entire webinar recording as well as the PowerPoint slide deck. So you'll have access to um, you know, the full recording and you'll be able to look at the slide deck in the future or share that with other peers or colleagues who might be interested as well. Um, and I saw a couple audio issues in the chat box just pop up. If at any point you can't hear or you're having audio issues, flag that for us in the chat box, um, and we can do our best to troubleshoot that for you. Um, and with that, I'm so grateful for our panelists to, to share their expertise and their time with us here today. Um, and I will now turn it over to Jennifer to get it started. Thanks. Jen, is your audio on? Yeah, I was having a hard time with that button. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Ash, can you advance us to the next slide? OK, um, so now you can see our faces a little bit. Um, we're very excited to uh, be able to share uh, with the group today some of our learnings around effective internship practice. Um, my name is Jennifer Gadu. I'm a regional director with Big Picture Learning. Uh, my role includes um, working with schools in the Northeast and Midwest um, that are developing uh, student-centered practice and internship, as well as uh, I do a lot of work with our professional development resources and training across our network. Um, I'm going to invite my colleagues to introduce themselves as well, starting with David. Hi there, everybody. My name is David Berg. I'm Director of Technology for Big Picture Learning. Um, I come from an education background. I uh, was a teacher at a big picture school for 10 years, as well as an assistant principal. And then I was on the leadership team and opening a new school uh, prior uh, or after that. And um, recently, in the last year, I've come on full time working for Big Picture Learning and, and really developing tech platforms to support our work. How about and, I'll hand it off uh, to Carrie. There we go. Carrie, you might be muted. How's that? There we go. 
All right. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm the principal of the Levitzer Center for Excellence. Uh, we're a big picture learning school in Massachusetts. We're in, we're about three and a half years into our development with the big picture model. Um, I've been watching big picture since the beginning, so it's a very good friend of mine, went to work there as an advisor. So uh, this model has been on my radar for quite some time, um, almost, well, 20 years I'll say. So, um, but I, you know, was a child prodigy when I started, so no worries. Um, but I'm looking forward to talking mm -hmm. with you all today. And uh, Carlene, um, can you say hello and introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Carlene Schnecker, and I am the principal of Union Big Picture High School in Nampa, Idaho. And we are in our third year of implementation. We have a population of about 200 students. And I have been in education for 22 years. However, um, only actively participating with Big Picture for four years, but learned about it eight years ago, so I'm super excited that we get to be a part of this now. Okay, um, can we move on to the next slide? So um, we really have a couple, just a couple goals for this time today. We want to talk about the attributes of a high-functioning internship program. So not all internships are equal. Um, we're going to talk about what we've learned around what makes internships highly effective in order to help students be prepared for their lives after graduation. Um, we're also going to talk about the specific considerations for developing an effective internship program. So we're going to run through uh, our learnings around school design and aspects of school design that support effective internship practice, compliance and safety, and we're also going to talk about networking and relationships, and then the overarching systems and structures to support this work. And you can go ahead and take us into the next slide. All right. So, um, uh, just Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Jen. All right, thanks. No, I'm just gonna you do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I just want to go through an agenda here. Um, so uh, we want to, you know, because this is a webinar format, we're going to use that chat box a lot to rely on your perspectives and comments. And I will just point out that uh, someone named Jeff just is is already um, already wanting to talk more with him because he's um, talking about a school that I helped open in Washington State. Um, and so um, we, we definitely would love to get your comments, your thoughts, your engagement in that chat box. Um, so, you know, what are your perspectives on internships? What are your goals? What are you headed towards with this work? I see a lot of really good comments popping up in the chat box already, and I know the folks from INACAL will help curate that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of big picture learning. We're also going to talk about then uh, go in, do a deep dive around some of the considerations for developing a robust internship program. That'll be about 20 minutes. And then we're going to spend 20 minutes split into two segments showing you some of the technology platforms that we have developed to um, support internships. Um, and that includes this platform we call Emblaze, which is an, a management tool for internships, as well as um, Learning Big Picture or our online professional development platform. That's the online PD part there. And then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit around uh, what Big Picture is first before we dive into the school design stuff. Um, Big Picture Learning is, is a nonprofit. We um, are not a CMO. We don't own or operate any schools. Uh, we're an organization that really supports innovative school design work that's happening all around the United States and, and in Canada and then also overseas. We um, affiliate with about 65 schools right now. Jen, you could correct me if that number needs to be updated. Um, but we, we have affiliations, meaning big picture schools, all around the United States. Um, we also do coaching work at, at these school sites and other school sites. We influence conversation around school redesign and innovation in high schools in particular. And, and some of the key pieces of a big picture school approach are things, two, two of those things are, you'll see, you hear them a lot in a lot of other contexts. Uh, one is this idea of personalized learning. The kids should be designing the learning, you should be a partner in designing learning uh, around their interests and around their desires and around their strengths. Um, the other piece is uh, an emphasis on relationships and that is often manifested in the advisory model where students develop strong relationships with folks on staff in the school. But the third piece that's really a hallmark of big picture learning is this idea of real world or place-based or internship learning, which is kids 
are getting out of school, leaving school to learn. Um, and this is really important from, from many different aspects. One is, a, is around engagement. If kids are disengaged in the content instruction that's happening within a traditional high school, for instance, we find and, and our evidence shows that getting kids out of school, learning with a mentor out in the real world, doing authentic work around that content stuff will really help bring their engagement back into the school and into the classroom. Um, and, and so this is getting into some of the school design stuff. And so you see on the top left there we have this uh, sort of equity icon. Um, one of the p important pieces with big picture learning is an emphasis around equity. And, and one of the really important things that we realize is that uh, social capital, the ability of students to be able to network to get the opportunities that they need is a, is a real issue of, of equity. Some st schools have, or some students have different social capital than other students. Um, and we see that particularly when we approach the idea of internships. Uh, schools that have really robust professional networks, let's say because the community around that school is perhaps really um, all computer engineers, for instance. Those are the parents of all the folks at that school. They're going to have a lot of social capital around technology and around engineering and things like that. And so they're going to sort of predetermine the direction of the opportunities that those kids can develop social capital towards. Um, and so you see this as a real issue of equity when you have kids in more affluent schools developing internships and, and, and building this robust internship program um, and what those look like as opposed to a less affluent school that's developing a really community-based internship program based on the networks that are available in that community. So, so we are taking a really important equity lens when we look at the internship process because building that social capital we do think is, uh, is a part of the school's job, a part of the, a part of the school's role. Um, so I will, um, and, and we also, I also should add that we think that building social capital and we think that kids um, having these real world experiences is a right for students. Students should have the right by the time they graduate high school to have a mentor to be able to have experiences out in the real world. We don't think of it necessarily as an enrichment. We think of it something that, that should be available for all students. Jen, you're next. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a couple of topics and then I'm actually going to get out of the way and let our practitioners on the call actually talk about those topics. Um, but what I'd like to do is I will sort of start off the uh, topic and then I'm going to invite Carrie and Carlene to weigh in on that. So our first topic is uh, staffing and relationships. Um, so what we've learned is that uh, you have very important considerations around the adults who are able to help guide these experiences for students and how to help students develop their own uh, relationship capital both in the network they're building through their internship and also um, in the, the life of the school and the connections across those. So I'm going to ask Carrie and Carlene if they would like to make a couple comments on um, lessons that they've learned and things that they found to be really important when they think about um, the relationship building and staffing to support powerful internship programs. Sure, I can start. Um, uh, we have, what we know from research is that um, students who have a supportive adult network of folks outside of the school are much more likely to be, to persist in their post-secondary goals and to be successful in those post-secondary goals. So that's something that we have really focused our attention on. Uh, we have actually even created a survey uh, to find out a lot of things about the internship program of our students. And Virtually all of our students can name at least one or two adults outside of the school building with whom they have a relationship. Um, and sometimes we even, when kids are struggling, have been able to sit down ourselves as a faculty and say, all right, so who else is important in this kid's life? How do we bring them into this problem solving around that? Um, it really it, it enriches the, the access that kids have. Um, and, and the resources of the school in a way that supports kids being successful. Carlene? So I would um, add to that, like, as Jen is talking about staffing, um, I think that it's not natural for typical traditional um, instructors to know how to go out and connect with the community. So it's also really important to expose your staff to being uncomfortable in the community because that's what we're asking our kids to do. 
Um, so the ongoing professional development practice to keep everybody talking with people our mentors at the community, and then like Carrie said, the mentorship is huge as well as, as well as parents. I would say this is the first time ever for school ever that we have sincere involvement with parents. So getting the parents and the mentors and the advisors all on board and supporting the kid in whatever they're learning, and um, not just going to a work site and being there, but rather going and learning about the profession and everybody being on board and helping the student do that. Jen? So um, a couple of other topics we want to talk about have a lot to do with um, leadership and leadership decisions. So we found that our most successful programs have uh, are really um, led in a visionary way through the leader of the school. So it's something that all of our school leaders are highly involved in, um, both as as vision setters and um, uh, motivators for their own team. Uh, because there is a lot of change that needs to happen in order to implement a successful internship program. So I'm going to ask if Carrie and Carlene want to talk a couple things about leadership. Um, so one, sort of about how leaders are um, guiding and, um, and setting a clear vision for their team in order to, to make that change to implement the internship program. And secondly, um, structural considerations around um, release time, scheduling, um, things like that that are sort of leadership decisions around the school that need to happen in order to carve out the appropriate space for the internship program. And also, I'm going to um, toot their horns because I don't know if they will, but Carrie and Carlene are on this call because they have done such a fantastic job of um, leading their teams in developing these really meaningful real-world learning approaches. So I'm going to ask Carrie um, to go ahead and, and step up and let us know a little bit about your experience as a leader in this work. Well, thanks, Jen. Um, we my experience, this has been the most enriching leadership work that I have ever done in my career as an educator, and I have well over 20 years in this field. Um, I think the thing that I most enjoy about this type of work is the level of collaboration. Um, I view my role as a leader uh, in this school as to kind of be like the advisor of my advisors, my staff who work here. I serve as their advisor, um, which really means I'm their coach. And so, a lot of the things that we do, we do together. Um, Carlene mentioned, you know, going out into the community. Sometimes for professional development, we will go to a site that we've never been to together and we'll take a, a leaving to learn trip together and then say, okay, so what would this be like for our kids and, and how could we incorporate this into our own practice? Um, the, for us, it's been important to be, well, for me, I think it's been important also to be a part of a network of folks who are moving in the same direction. That has helped me um, find solutions, find strength when we face challenges. Um, it's also been really helpful to not feel like we're constantly trying to reinvent the wheel, but that there are folks who are doing things really well, and we can be a part of that, and we can learn from that. Um, so that's been really an important um, part of my practice. Carlene, do you want to add to that? Maybe some, thinking about some special considerations such as structures? Yeah, um, and I would absolutely double down on everything that Carrie said. This has been the best leadership experience I've had. Um, and to add to the, the belief system, the leader of the school has to have strong focus and beliefs to keep everyone driving in that direction, and that includes district office people, um, board of trustees, parents, staff, students, and because I have found that people tend to resort to schooly when they struggle with stuff, and so bringing them back to um, real world, world functionality is so important, and so you have to have a clear vision, and the leader has to keep the whole team focused in that vision. Um, as far as structures and scheduling, uh, re re release time, I have found that that is so dependent on the state and the state laws and um, what school boards require, but you definitely need to find the best way to get your kids out in the community as much as possible, as much as your state and your district will legally allow. Um, and then the size of your school matters, so you can manage the internships in the community and make sure that your advisors are able to still make meaningful connections with 
to mentors and not just be in the building supervising kids all the time. So I'm going to build on Jen? Uh, that. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to build on that point uh, and transition us into our next section. Um, but to sort of give a little bit of insight into uh, some of the magic that makes these programs work, uh, the majority of our schools that are doing internship programs um, take an approach where they have uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth later on, uh, but they have a, they may have an internship coordinator or a leader who helps to develop uh, relationships, so that it sort of works as uh, uh, there are branches of a tree off from there. So teachers uh, function as an advisor with a small group of students, and that advisor is the one who sort of shepherds them through the preparation for an internship experience that includes interest exploration um, and helping students to make those connections in the community. Um, and we'll talk more about how we prepare adults for those roles in this work. Um, and also, too, that most of our schools send students to internships during the school day, um, either one or two days out of the week. We have a lot of exceptions and variety around that, but we found that um, we one of the, the major successes of our approach to internships is that it's directly connected to the learning in the school. So we believe that the learning that happens at the internship is every bit as valuable as the learning that happens within the school. So it's part of our actual school program. I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to talk a little bit more on our next slide around um, some of the important uh, considerations around um, safety and legality around internships. Right. So um, just to be clear in the articulation, we kept this slide deck super simple, but there, we've broken this into four categories of, uh, of, of things that need to be addressed for a robust internship program. The one we just talked about is school design. There's a lot more conversation we can have a lot around that. What I'm about to talk about is compliance and safety. Um, and then there's also networking and relationships and systems and structures. Those are the four categories. So with compliance and safety, um, I think it's really important for schools on the outset to have a real, there's a tendency, I think, for schools to just be like, oh, like school leaders and the internship coordinators in an emerging program to just be like, this is scary and I just don't want to look at it. I don't want to know about it. I don't want to have that conversation. And I definitely don't want to talk to the school's risk management or legal team. Oh, my God. Um, I, I would advise against that approach. Um, I think that it's, it's good to give yourself a long enough runway in developing a program to really take a look at the, um, the legal implications, some of the liability issues, and make sure that you're really upfront about that all with the school district and with your parents and with the entire community around this. Um, a couple things to note, and also, you know, as, as Jen's going to talk about, with our PD platform, we have a lot of resources available about all of this stuff. Um, so we, I'm not, I, I hesitate to send you out to the wolves like, okay, just figure this out. We have a lot of resources to support these kinds of things. Um, and so the first thing though is um, there's a federal law called the, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And there's actually a link to a National Law Review article that summarizes that piece of legislation. Um, that's a federal law that mostly direct, most directly affects what are called unpaid internships or these, these work-based learning experiences. That's federal law. Every state and even in some instances counties have employment law and you'll need to know that. And so it's, it's impossible for me to say what it is for where you are. Uh, but it's, it's good for you to know that. Um, I'll, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, with, the, uh, with this Fair Labor Standards Act, there are six criteria that they, that your uh, internship programs need to comply with in order for them to be in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And, and basically what this comes down to is the employer or the business um, could be sued if, if by the student if, um, they're not, if they're not in compliance with these six standards. Okay, um, so the, the six standards, one is that the, and this is again very, very brief overview, but one thing is that it needs to be a training experience. And, and so languaging things, maybe not as an internship, but as a work-based learning experience can be really helpful for that. The second thing is that it has to show clear benefit for the student, for the intern. Third thing is that it, it can't displace employ, employees. So they can't fire somebody to hire a free intern. Okay, and that, some of this is like no-brainer, but, but important to note. Uh, four is that there's no immediate advantage for the business, and that's a tricky one. When we talk about authentic learning, we want students to be off doing authentic project work at internships, but the companies need to know that the Fair Labor Standards Act says that there needs to be no immediate advantage from this kid's work. So if the kid is doing something that is directly um, 
generating revenue for the business, that's tricky. You have to be careful with that. And there are ways around that. that we, there are ways um, to negotiate that. So things like, for instance, doing work that's more in the public domain. That's something that's really good for the business, but then the students are sharing the results of that work in the public domain. That's a way around that, for example. Um, and then uh, the fifth thing is that the students aren't entitled to a job afterwards. Um, that they need to know that, that this doesn't turn into a job automatically. And the sixth thing is that there can't be pay. Um, and so those are the six criteria for uh, a business to be in compliance with the Fair, St Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, the next piece around this, again, gets to the local laws, um, is that it's, it's good to realize uh, what, how you're languaging things. Um, the term work-based learning uh, can be interchangeable with internship, but in a legal sense, there's some jurisdictions where work-based learning means one thing, and it actually can be easier to incorporate that, whereas internship means something different. And, and for instance, a lot of large corporations, when they say internship, that means a paid internship. That is what it is. And internships are paid. Um, where, whereas when you call it work-based learning experience, then it gives you more flexibility in terms of it being an unpaid experience. So that's an example of that. Okay, the next piece of safety and compliance is around background checks, um, making sure that your students are safe. Your students are going out into the real world and they're going into workplaces and they're doing this work surrounded by adults. Um, the sad reality that we see in the news now is, is our students um, are under threat and whether they're within school bounds or school walls or not. So um, there's important cultural considerations to take into a component here, uh, to, into account here. You need to have honest conversations with parents about this, um, that your students will be out in the real world. Now, um, there are some good baseline standards for who st students should interact with in the adult world and who they should not. And the, and the general baseline rule is that you don't want students interacting with someone who's been convicted of a sexual offense, okay? And as a result, every state that I'm aware of has some sort of free online database of convicted sex offenders. And so you're able to, as a baseline, anybody that's going to be a mentor, you can run their, their address and their name and find out if they're a sex offender. And if they're a sex offender, I think it's legitimate to say that they should not be a mentor for a student. I think we'd all agree to that. Now, beyond that, that's a conversation that you need to have with parents, with all your stakeholders, parents, with legal folks. So for instance, is it okay for someone who was uh, convicted of assault 10 years ago because they got into a bar fight, is it okay for them to be a mentor? Well, I'm not the one to say whether or not that's to be the case, but that's a conversation that you should have. Um, and if it is okay, well, how do you want to find out that information? So you can do a couple different things to find out folks' um, convictions and whether or not they've had offenses on their record. Um, you can uh, ask them to provide that information, first of all. Um, you can also do um, some sort of a background check, or you could do an FBI live scan fingerprinting. I want to say for the record that FBI live scan fingerprinting, there's a lot of evidence that it's actually not the most thorough examination of someone's criminal record without getting into details why I can provide resources on that. Um, but the other thing is that it tends to be a, a non-starter for a student-driven internship program. It's too great of a burden to ask a mentor to drive to your school district office and get fingerprinted and pay potentially the $65 to get fingerprinted. And it's intrusive. And also, just so you know, there's real equity implications there. Um, and so um, without getting into too great a detail, African-American males tend to have a much higher um, incidence of being on the FBI's database, even if they had charges that were dismissed. So they were never actually convicted of a crime. Um, and so it, it, it limits your opportunity to, provi to provide real quiet quality mentors. What I strongly recommend, if you want to know that level of detail, is that you look into electronic background checks. They're very thorough and arguably more thorough than an FBI live scan. And they are less intrusive on the mentor. Okay. Um, Oh, we're running over. Thank you, Jen. Okay, I'm going to go really quick here. Um, and so um, the next thing is having some sort of family agreement or contract so everybody knows everything, the logistics, like when kids are going to internships, um, and, but also things around who's responsible for what, who's responsible for insurance, for insuring the kid. Um, you need to talk with your district folks around liability um, and things like that. And so I'm going to 
I'm going to stop there because I know we're already running over um, and ask Terry and Carlene any thoughts that you have or experiences that you have to add around compliance or background checks or thoughts there. And just be in mind, in mind be mindful that you might be on mute. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. This is Carlene. Um, I just but thinking there are age requirements at some places as well, so be sensitive to that. Um, some places, as much as we would like them to take our students and as much as our students have the skills to be there, they can't be until they're 16 or they're 18 or something like that. But we work really hard around those situations. Um, and then as far as like compliance challenges and stuff like that, it's just um, a constant Navigating again what the district legally can cover. Um, you don't want to put your teachers in jeopardy, uh, but you want to give your kids the best experience possible. And when David was mentioning background checks, one of the things we do, um, Idaho has online system where public records you can look. So we look for background checks in Idaho repository online or icourts.idaho.gov where we can look up most information about people in our state. Carrie? Hi, we also have a super easy system <clears throat> that um, is already in place. Any volunteers who come into a school, any school in the district, have to have what's called a quarry check in Massachusetts. And it's a free service that's provided. Um, we just collect a little bit of information from the mentors. And then I go ahead and run the quarry checks in the computer right here myself. It's super quick and it's super easy. And the turnaround time is um, it's really fast. So I would say just check what, what already exists, um, but also be prepared to have a lot of questions that nobody will have the answer to because you may be trying to do something that hasn't been done before and people haven't really thought about it. So it's really good to be kind of uh, proactive in thinking about, well, what might be the possible answers or possible solutions to these questions before you go and, and um, start asking the folks that you think might have the answers for you. Great. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Dean. Um, can we advance to the next slide? We're going to move into our next um, category of considerations, which is networking and relationships. Um, so one of the first things that we do on our uh, PD platform and in our work with schools is to help them build their communication plans. Um, and it starts with, um, you know, an elevator pitch. So what is it that your internship program really does? Um, what is the benefit that it brings to students? What is the benefit it brings to the internship site? Um, and we think about it as a, you know, sort of the death of the salesman that always be closing. Um, we, we consider every interaction that you're having in your community to be a potential interaction with a new mentor for your school. Um, so we do a lot to help condition students, their families, um, and uh, the adults in the school to think about the ways that they're representing their program when they're out in the world. Um, we also look a lot to what is already existing in your community. What are the networks that you can uh, connect with? Is there a business alliance or a community organization um, that will have a lot of connections for you? We also rely a lot on families. So we think about, um, you know, how do we connect with families and find out um, through those family connections uh, what are the internships, like David mentioned earlier. So what is the already existing capital we have in our school community to help build out our internship uh, mentors? So um, David will be showing a little bit about our, um, our platform for managing those relationships and managing those potential internship sites, uh, but it really comes down to personal connections. So um, much of the work that we do is in helping uh, students and adults to do that communication, to represent their program, and um, for them always to be thinking about um, every interaction they're having in the community. Like, is this a person who does interesting work? Is this something that our students would really be wanting to do? Is this a person who might be a great mentor? We also really think about different opportunities for building that real-world learning experience. So ideally, we've been talking about like full-day internships, but we also do things um, that are called informational interviews, where students will prepare to interview a professional, which is kind of counterintuitive. We also we all often think about students being prepared to be the interviewee, but we're actually preparing them to be the interviewer, so that they can actually go out and learn from professionals. But they're also building that capacity and that relationship with that professional that may end up becoming a full-time mentor. We also have shadow day opportunities in our schools where students can uh, spend a day in an organization, which isn't a full commitment for the mentor, 
um, they may decide that they want to be a mentor based on that experience for the student. So we have a lot of different opportunities as points of entry for that real world learning experience. Um, we also think about, as we're, we're navigating our networking work in our schools, are what are the roles of the different adults in the building? So I sort of signaled this a little earlier in the webinar today, but the, the individuals that are doing the, the work in the schools are often highly involved in building out that network of mentors. So a classroom teacher or an advisor may be working with students individually to help probe what are the existing connections that they can find in the community. We may have an internship coordinator who oversees all of the outreach that uh, is doing a lot of work in building what we call warm leads for the school. Uh, we may have a school leader who is highly active in that process of identifying potential mentors. Uh, but I think one of the most important uh, people within the building for building those relationships are the students. So with our students, we help them to, as I mentioned, become advocates and representatives for their school and their internship program, uh, but we also have, we, we help them learn how to uh, contact potential mentors and to set up those initial informational interviews or shadow days. The students are, are, are really the foot soldiers in building out that network for the school. They're the best representatives you have and they will make the most compelling case for why someone should become a mentor. And we can move on to our next slide. I'm going to turn it back over to David to talk through some of our systems and structures. All right. So these, um, again, I'm going to go really briefly here to try to get us back on schedule. Um, but these are some of the other systems and structure considerations to take into account. Um, so one is transportation, logistics, how kids will get to their internships. Um, some, some things to consider is public transit, obviously. Um, inter utilizing the existing network of schools around a community so kids could perhaps ride buses, working with your district so they could ride buses to get close to their internship site um, that may be near an, an, an another school in your district. Um, but also things like carpool networks of parents. Um, and even in rural areas, I know that one of our schools in uh, Reno, Nevada, they got funding to buy a van. Um, and they used the van to get kids to the more far away internships. Um, so those are some options to consider. Um, student choice is important. We think, as, as Jen was talking about there, um, that you should come up with a systems, system so that students drive the process. One of the pitfalls that we see is um, schools will build an internship program and they'll think of it, and they'll try to come up with ways to economize and to be efficient. And so they'll do something like they'll go to a large business and they'll solicit a large business and the business will say, yeah, we'll take 20 kids. And all 20 kids will show up on a set day. And they'll get paired up maybe randomly with mentors. There's no student choice in saying, I want to go to this business because. There's no cho student choice in saying, I want to work with a, this particular mentor because dot, dot, dot. And so really diving deep and understanding what's the value of, that each mentor brings to the table. What, are they, what is their area of work? Work, what are their interests, what are their strengths, uh, what kind of kids do they work best with, and really trying to identify that is what builds a high quality internship program. So letting kids drive that is, is super important. Um, you need to be able to track attendance and we'll show you some of that uh, functionality. All of this functionality, by the way, that I'm going over here is almost all like, like our platform in Blaze does this stuff for you. It manages the systems and structures. Um, compliance, keeping track of the, whatever the, the, the legal requirements and the documents that you decide, whether it's background checks or parent agreements, keeping track of all that stuff and making sure that your internships are in compliance is a, is a challenge and, and we have some of the answers to that. Um, communication is important, setting up some norms around how, how your staff communicate with mentors, how frequently do they, go, they, they communicate with mentors, how frequently they do site visits whether they do an on-site internship setup meeting, whether they do an on-site internship project setup meeting, whether they do an on-site internship end or wrap-up meeting. Those kinds of uh, setting up those norms are super important. Um, networking is important, as Jen was talking about, recognizing that a school is a really compelling networking resource and figuring out how to tap into that. And then deciding 
uh, grades and credits. Uh, are these internships after school program? They're not for credits. They're not for grades. Is this a course? Is this a series of courses? Is this uh, some sort of competency att attainment if you're running a competency-based program? And then what are the metrics of success? Um, deciding what, what you're looking for in your rollout of this, how many kids you want out at internships in year one, year two, year three, what sort of distribution of opportunities that you have, how many, how much choice students have in choosing opportunities, things like that. Um, so I uh, will go back to, um, to Jen now, I think, for slide eight, um, and going over learning big picture. So we can uh, flip to the next slide. So I'm going to, uh, talk a little bit about what we've done to develop resources for educators to help uh, build these strong and improve on their internship programs. We established an LMS, a learning management system, uh, about two years ago called Learning Big Picture. And the way the platform works is, um, we, well, we set some very important goals. So we wanted to make all of our content align with high impact practices. So we have 20 years of experience in making mistakes on real world learning that we've learned from. So we wanted to make sure that we could represent um, work that would support student-centered internships, um, that would support uh, rigorous learning through internships, that would support connecting the internship experience to the academics of the school. We also wanted to uh, make sure that it, it was something that contained what we call the big picture magic. So we do so much of our work is in, in direct relationship. You know, we connect and we work with our schools. Um, you know, we really emphasize relationship building, so we wanted to, to create a platform that would help to carry some of that magic into the learning that our adult educators are doing. We also are a highly collaborative organization, and we feel that we learn best from each other. Um, this is one of the reasons that we're so excited to have Carlene and Terry in this work with us is that um, we learn from our schools as much as our schools are learning from the content that we've created. So we want to make sure that we have lots of opportunities for learners to, to learn from each other, to connect with each other, and to collaborate, and to also share their best work. So we wanted to create a platform that would allow us to do all of those things. So I'm going to show you just a few things um, around uh, our online platform. Give me just a second as I'm trying to make sure that I can share my screen here. I'm really sorry. Ashley, can you tell me again? I mean, this is our first time using this platform. Oh, here we go. Share desktop. I think this will work. All right. So what you're seeing right now, um, I have a few tabs I want to show you. The first one is um, sort of this tab, an overview of our coursework. So we broke down and thought about what are all the most important components to an internship program and how can we group the resources around those components. And so these are courses that we created for uh, teachers, for internship coordinators, for school leaders to help to implement high impact internship processes. So the first one is a foundational uh, course called the why and how of internships. So what this really does is break down what kind of learning happens in, re in a real world situation. How is it different from what happens in schools? How is it connected? Um, what are the things that students are getting out of this? What does the research base around internships tell us? So our foundational course is sort of the rationale and a little bit around the process of internships. We then built out a course around communication. So communication is one of the most important aspects of this work. We want schools to be able to communicate about their programs. We want mentors to be able to communicate back to schools about student progress. We want to be able to communicate about the learning that's happening. Um, so this course helps to, uh, to create understandings in the school community and to give tools to both students and to educators around how to make sure that they build strong communication plans. Um, the next course that we uh, looked at is, is we, you know, the first two courses go through sort of the process of finding internships and helping students to establish what is it that they're passionate about? Like, what is the career that they want to explore right now? What is the best place for them? Um, and then most of our schools think, well, we've gotten to that point and our work here is done. We've gotten the student an internship. Um, but we believe that that's when the actual real work starts. So the next two courses in this progression go into what's happening at the internship. So we try to build a student-centered and student-led project work so that they can be learning through, we call it learning through internships, so that there is a goal to their learning. Um, they are encouraged to build out their inquiry skills and their curiosity and follow that in the internship so that they can really thoroughly investigate that experience. And then the next course is around project monitoring and evaluation. 
So we wanted um, to really support our educators. This is a course that doesn't just apply to internships. It can apply to your personal life. It can apply to your classroom. But how do you set benchmarks for progress? <clears throat> how do you establish um, what is the goal that you're working towards through this work in the internship? And then how do you evaluate? Well, how do you evaluate the student work and also the student experience in the internship site? And then um, shortly, David is going to introduce Emblaze, which is our internship management platform. We also have content that we created to help with onboarding around um, schools that are implementing this platform. So our actual LMS, I'm just going to give you a snapshot <clears throat> because um, this is, uh, the Blackburn platform is not really ideal, um, but we're also running right now um, a opportunity for educators to access this platform for free. So we can talk about that a little later. But in each of the courses, you'll see that there's a mix of different types of activities. We have lessons, um, we have text, we have activities for um, the classroom, we have assignments, so um, anyone who interacts with our platform can submit an assignment to us and then they'll receive a whole bunch of feedback. So it, uh, it's staffed by our um, national organization. So we have folks, you can see here, um, instructor David Berg, myself, um, Carlos Osuna is our instructional designer. So we actually um, interact directly with all of our users so we can see sort of the progress of their work. Um, we have forums so users can connect with each other and learn from each other. And we also have a question and answer function. So um, people can sort of like take a shot in the dark, um, raise a question that they may be curious about. We also have on our platform um, uh, opportunities called channels where users can connect with each other um, post their own content. Um, so we have thematic channels we, where uh, we'll say, well, we're going to talk specifically about goals for learning in this channel, and then folks can contribute to that conversation or upload resources. Um, our platform is also really video rich. Uh, we have a lot of content video from students, so you can actually hear from students or see them in the internship site. Um, Carrie, on this call, um, we brought cameras into her school and we followed uh, as an advisor and a student and a mentor through the conversation around setting up a project. And then we took that video content and we associated it with all sorts of resources that could help schools to do that more successfully. So what we've built with this platform is really an approach to supporting all the multiple steps um, in training the adults to, to build and implement a highly successful internship program. We also have assessment, we have an internship quality assessment we can do with schools that have existing programs to help them figure out and surface what might be the improvement goals that they have for their own internship program, and then we can recommend specific content for them um, as a result of that assessment. So that's sort of in a, in a nutshell um, what our platform looks like. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague David, who's going to be able to um, talk a little bit more about the Emblaze platform, which is our internship management system. Great. Jen, can you stop sharing your screen or uh, I'm going to call folks. I'm, I'm, I try, I'm trying, David. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. I know. It's a little tricky. All right. Uh, I'm loading up right now. Hey, so folks, while, I'm, while we're waiting for that to load up, I'm pasting in the chat bar. This is a link to a web, uh, web page that I'm going to share with you just briefly here. We know that there's a little bit of a lag time on the tech here, and so this isn't the greatest platform for us to show showcase technology platforms. Um, so uh, bear with us here. I'm still waiting for uh, application sharing has stopped. So it starts to switch mode. Uh, let's try that. Let's try this again. There we go. Okay. Um, so let me start with here quickly. Um, so this, that link I just shared is to this workflow um, about the platform that I'm talking about in Blaze. Um, and I point this out because each of these steps in the core workflow that this platform performs have videos associated with it to show how it works on the platform. So it's a good resource uh, for us. Um, I'm going to stop that share if I can here. Let's see if I can manage this. Uh, here it is. And let me just stop that share and then try again here. Um, and then I'm going to go here. Oh, look at this. I am director of technology now. Bam. All right. Um, so um, you guys should all see a mobile device screen here. Um, please, somebody come on and with your voice if you don't. Um, but what you see here is, uh, is my phone right now. And so there's the Emblaze app, uh, which is for students. So they can go onto this and um, search for internships that you curate at your school site. 
um, and so that you could keep track at your school site of the development of the relationships and do some practical things like manage attendance, for instance. So if we open up this app, the first thing that we see here is there's a, there's a social feed. We think it's really important for students to know that, first of all, students, when, when they see an app, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is legit. This is a real thing. This internship program is for real. As much as kids um, hate, complain about school, they're actually pretty terrified to leave school. And mm -hmm. so when they see that there is an app to manage it, and when they see things like um, that kids can share opportunities with each other, or they, when they can see that their friends have gotten an internship, that helps reinforce that this is something that's real. Um, you see that there's this, down at the bottom there, there's, there's notifications, search, opportunities, attendance, and profile. If I click on search here, we'll see there's 105 opportunities in this school. So we don't, uh, we don't build the data set. You do that work uh, on the ground at your school within your community. That's all the work that Jen was talking around, around leveraging the networks that you have. Um, but when you build those, you want to put that information in some sort of a relationship management space, and that's what Emblaze is. So kids could search for internships. They could search based on their interests. They could add opportunities to their wish lists if they want. They could search based on location. Um, these, normally this would zoom right into a region, but we have in internships in this data set all over the place. So they could see what opportunities are near them. They could see if they're available or being pursued. That one's, uh, this one's available, so we can go into this one here. Um, you also see it down at the bottom, this is super important, there's the Suggest New Opportunity button. If a student does a search and they don't find an internship that they're interested in, again, interest is driving everything, we don't want that to be a dead end. What we want kids to recognize is that they have social capital and they have a professional network around them, their friends, their neighbors, their parents, their parents' friends. And so if they don't find an internship in this data set, that your school is curating that interests them, they could suggest opportunities. And that then brings that data, that connection in a real authentic way, driven by a kid, into your school's data set. So it builds your school's connection in your network. And we can go to the details here. And again, the school curates all this, so they can add a picture there. They can name, come up with naming conventions. Is this a paid internship? Is it a 16 and over internship? Um, you come up with your own conventions there. You see that there's a difference between profession and organization type. Again, we want schools to identify what's the profession of the mentor. And, and then is that the same as the organization type? Because maybe this is an accounting internship at an interior design firm. We want kids to recognize that and see that information. Schools can curate the description here. Some schools will add things around what the credits could be earned for this internship. Um, others will add things around what the pathway to landing this internship. Um, you see also there's a map there without going into it because I know the screen is kind of laggy. Kids can click on that and it will open up the native mapping app on their phone. And so they can figure out well, what would be the logistics of getting to this internship. They can use the public transit functionality of the native mapping app on their device to figure out how they would even get to this internship. They can see information about the organization. Again, all curated by you. Information about the mentor. Now they don't see much information here about the mentor because the kid has not been approved to pursue this site yet. Once they are approved to pursue this site and try to land the internship, they'll see more information. Um, and they also see previous interns there. So they'll see an, a relational history of all the other kids that have been at this place in the past. Uh, lastly, and Jen's asking me to move quickly here, so um, we will see there that there's a little share button on the top right, and so kids could share these opportunities with each other. I'm not going to go through this request process because I really want to show you the attendance piece. So this kid has an internship right now. It's at Jurassic Park in Orlando. And so if they click on this link because they're showing up at their internship for the day, they could check in. It takes a snapshot of their location. Obviously, I'm very, very far from my internship right now. We go check in. It asks some basic prompts. Is your mentor there? Uh, what are your goals today to clean the dinosaur, dinosaurs, forgive my typing. Anything else you want to share? Nope. Uh, we'll click Submit. And at the end of the day, the kid goes to check out. Again, it does the same thing, takes a snapshot of the location. The school sees all this stuff live in real time. So the school will see when kids are checking in and where they are when they checked in. What did you accomplish today? Cleaned. I'm being really brief here, but this level of communication is really important to gauge impact and how well the kids are doing and what they're doing at their internships. And then now when I submit this, the mentor at the internship site now just got an email from this student asking him to verify the attendance. So I'll actually do this on my phone just to go quick here. Um, if I look here, I'm the mentor for this internship. 
So if I check my email, me, the mentor, uh, my name is Ellie, has just gotten an email asking me to verify the kid's attendance for the day. And so I could really quickly just um, verify the kid's attendance for the day here. I could confirm this. This is, um, you know, like, yep, that time is right. That time is right. I can quickly give some comments about how the kid was today. David was great. And then I could decide if I want to share those comments with the student. I also have the teacher's email address down there at the bottom. I hit submit. And this loads up a little bit better on a web, on a computer. But also, um, if the kid has a LinkedIn profile um, associated in Emblaze, we want mentors to endorse the kid for skills in LinkedIn. Kids are out there in the real world doing these real world experiences. They should be assessed in the real world, and that real world place is that professional development network that's LinkedIn. So this drives the mentors to the student's LinkedIn profile to endorse the kid for those real world skills so that when they graduate high school, they have this really robust LinkedIn platform or LinkedIn profile. Um, so I, I'll show you one other quick thing. If I can get out of this screen share here and go back over to my screen, I just want to show you the attendance piece. Uh, do that, and then go back and share here. I'm getting good at this. All right. And so now if we look at the mentor view, the teacher view here, excuse me, the teacher view here, the teacher can log into Emblaze. I'm going to refresh this just so we see that um, I logged attendance just now. And so we see right away in here there's an, a warning because this is not the time for my internship. So it's letting me know as a teacher, hey, something's up here. But I can also go into attendance here and see Watch kids check in. So this kid checked in at 11.53 Pacific time. Um, it was approved by the mentor, but it was late. Uh, and checked out, it confirmed that, uh, it, the mentor confirmed it, but it checked out early. Oh, let's go look at the details here because the mentor left comments. I can look at that up. I could see where the kid was when they checked in, very far from their internship. I could see all the comments that the, that the student left, and I could see the mentor comments there. All right, um, I will just stop by saying if you want a fuller demonstration of either of these platforms, either Learning Big Picture or Emblaze, please get in touch with us. We're happy to do that. All right, let me stop my screen share here. Uh, give me one second. Um, I just want to thank right. Carlene and Carrie who have been manning the chat uh, or womaning the chat very effectively. Um, we had a lot of great questions come through there, but we wanted to save time at the very end here on our last slide um, for any specific questions and also to share uh, contact information. Ashley, could you bring up our last slide? Or I don't, I'm not sure who's actually shown. There we go. Um, so we've had some really great chats in uh, and questions around um, CTE work, um, around competency um, versus traditional uh, pathways to graduation. Um, and we also wanted to share our contact information, um, David at BigPictureLearning.org, Jennifer at BigPictureLearning.org. And if you're trying to reach Carmen or Carrie, <coughs> please just email us and we'll <laughs> forward it to them. Um, but we wanted to see if there are any specific questions. Um, we, are, we do have access to these platforms um, that we can make available for you if you reach out to us directly. We'd love to help you. Um, but one of the questions from Curtis is, do you have any experience with securing paid internships at employers? Um, I'm going to actually turn this over to Carrie and Carlene, who are working most directly with students. Um, and see if they have anything that they'd like to contribute to that question. I, this is Carlene. Um, I try really hard to avoid the paid internship thing because of all the legal um, issues that David was talking about earlier, the six criteria. However, I do have a lot, a lot, a lot of mentors that hire my students, either for summer jobs or for weekends or post high school. I've had several students now that when they graduated, their mentor offered them a job at their final exhibition. So I would say it's definitely making those connections, but I try not to um, confuse the learning opportunity with the paid opportunity because you don't want it to look like you put a kid in an employer's job and then get in trouble. Carrie? You know, I echo all of that same over here in Massachusetts. Um, and also our, our kids at their internships is considered time on learning, <clears throat> so we can't really pay them for that. Um, but we've had the very exact same experience. So also local youth um, workforce and investment boards, things like that, youth work programs, tend to be the, the vehicle that 
it comes up with the money for kids to get paid internships. So while the site may have a student working there, uh, the salary doesn't come from the site, but it comes from some sort of grant program for youth labor development. Um, I'd just like to add to that, Curtis. Some of our schools are serving um, students who are over age and or may have significant financial need. Um, and in some of the places where we're working, we're able to partner um, with a district or a state program that will support employment for those students um, in connection to the internship program. The thing that we do want to really emphasize around um, the values of an internship is that it's a learning experience, as, as Carrie and Carleen mentioned. Um, we want it to be about exposure and about kids um, dreaming big. So we want to be able to connect them to um, opportunities that can, can really play out potentially for the rest of their lives or really inform the decisions they're making. So when we think about um, the easy opportunities for them to be paid uh, employees, that doesn't necessarily align with um, the more rigorous learning experience they may have from an unpaid internship. So those are some of the really important considerations that we have to make when we think about um, whether or not they should be paid for the experience. Um, I know that we are um, pushing up on 3 o'clock here. I don't know if we have any other um, lingering questions or burning questions that we didn't get to address, but I definitely want to express a real gratitude for being able to um, share some of our learning with you um, and a real gratitude for our team, um, especially Carrie and Carleen, for sharing their own experience as, as leaders in this work. And then um, I don't know if there's any last words you want to add, David or Carrie or Carleen. Carrie says, thank you all, and please reach out if you have questions. We, all, we are all on the same page there. We'd be happy to hear from anyone on this uh, or any other call. So thank you for your time. Yes, thank, thank you for you. allowing us to share our knowledge. And feel free to reach out. Jen and David know how to get a hold of us if we can help in any way. On behalf of everyone in attendance, I think I can uh, speak for everyone. Thank you all. What a wealth of information. Um, and David, great job on the technology. And Carrie and Carleen, um, you did a great job addressing folks' questions in the chat box as we went. So thank you for sharing this wonderful information. As I mentioned at the outset, we will uh, follow up via email and share this archive with you so you can refer back to these conversations. Um, and certainly feel free to reach out to our presenters today if you have any further questions that didn't get answered today. Um, and I will close with one final um, plug here that the INACOL Symposium, which is held in October in Nashville, um, is currently seeking proposals to present. So if you are interested in presenting at our flagship event, um, feel free to check out our website. You can find information on submitting proposals there. They are due this Friday on March 16th. So if you're interested in submitting, make sure you get it in in time. We'd love um, to have you all submit proposals. So again, thank you all so much for attending today, and we'll see you on a future webinar. Take care.